morning, church. Great to see you. Great to see you online. Good to have you back with us. I hope you'll chime in and let us know you're here. Great to have our on-site campus and our online campus going simultaneously. I want to ask you a question. Have you guys heard about this story in the news about a school before the quarantine hit where a teacher asked uh, the students to bring in unblown up balloons, not blown up balloons, that would be dangerous. They brought them in and they had every kid blow up their own balloon and then they had to take a, a Sharpie and write their own name on the balloon, okay? Everybody with me so far? So they took these balloons, the teacher said, now go into the hallway and throw your balloon into the hall. So they did that, and then the teachers closed all the doors, and the teachers ran through the hall and shuffled them all up and got them all mixed up. And it was this incredible sight. Now, then the teachers came out and said, here's what I want you to do. I want you, when we blow this whistle, to go as fast as you can, find your balloon. Okay? You have five minutes to find your balloon. So they blew it on your mark. Get set, go, and the kids ran off, and it was pandemonium. You, was chaos. you know they were loving it at first, but then the clock started ticking, and they made the announcement, four minutes left, four minutes left, find your balloon, and no one had found their balloon yet. It's like, all right, we got to go. Is this it? Oh, that's not me, and they're running, and they're finding. Three minutes left, they can't find. Two minutes left, and it is chaos, and it's only getting worse. People are getting more jacked up. People are starting to get angry, elbow, give me my balloon, I thought my balloon. 30 seconds left, 10 Nine, eight, all the way down to one, and brrr, freeze. Now, if you found your balloon with your name on it, hold it up. Not one person found their own balloon. Not one. Can you believe that? So then the teacher said, now here's what we're going to do. You're already frozen. I want everyone to look down, and I want you to grab the balloon that is closest to you. So they grabbed the balloon that was closest to you, and they said, I want you to go give it to the person whose name is written on that balloon. Guess what? In less than two minutes, every single kid had their balloon. Every single one. And then the teacher got them all quiet and they said, here's the lesson. Balloons are like friendship and love and happiness. No one will ever find it looking for theirs only. But instead, if everyone cares about each other's, then they will find their own quickly as well. Wow, what a powerful lesson. Those kids remember that. I remember that. I remember seeing that. I'm like, oh, I cannot wait to share that with this church. But here's a sad reality. Most of us don't live that way. Putting other people's needs first, looking after our neighbor, loving others, that does not come naturally. Being a true friend, loving our neighbor. Man, this is something that has been encouraged of us all the way back in Old Testament times. People we look up to, even they struggle with it. Even King Saul, who proudly declared his love and friendship for David, said this. Check this out, David. He says, I love this, Saul loves David. One page over, Saul seeks to kill David. <laughs> well, that escalated quickly. <laughs> now, maybe you're not wanting to kill your friends today. I really hope you're. In fact, if you are, would you contact me? I will put you to the head of the counseling line. We will get together. We'll work through that. So if you're not wanting to like, be that drastic, Maybe we could admit, at least, that loving others is a little messy. Loving others is a challenge because we are inherently self-focused. We are prone to look at ourselves first. As easy as it is to put our desires above everyone else's, that's not what Jesus has called us to do. He has called us to love others the same way we love ourselves. And we looked at this last week, right? We looked at the great command. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. As we look around the world, man, we see so many people who are not doing this. Some of it is even in the church. And we look around and we think, man, to love others first, that is so hard. That is so counterintuitive. That means i got to be selfless, not selfish. That means I actually have to be intentional with my love. Even back then, Jesus' words were actually already well known. Did you know that? Before he even spoke them. If you were a Jew and you were a practicing Jew during that time, you immediately recognize these words. You know why? Because Jesus didn't originate these. Did you know these actually come from the Old Testament? He was quoting from Leviticus. This is where it was first quoted. You remember last week we talked about if you really want to find out the deep truth of a scripture, employ the law of first mention. Anybody remember that? Yeah, awesome. The law of first mention. That means go back and find when God used it for the very first time because there is awesome, hidden, deep truth. This is where it is first mentioned, where God shows up on the scene and says, y'all, I'm going to sum up why you are here. 
what it's all about. So turn with me, open your Bible, Leviticus 19. If you're pulling up your digital favorite Bible app and you want to sync up, I'm going to be in the NKJV today, the New King James for the most part. We're going to start in verse 15 and read uh, probably through verse 18 or so. Leviticus 19, all right, let's follow along together. It says this, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Wow, what does that mean? You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people. Hmm. You shall not take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Verse 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But here it is. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And there it is. The original, the OG, love your neighbor as yourself comes right here as the conclusive statement at the end of this series of all these commands, and it dates all the way back to God, excuse me, God's laws given to Moses for the Israelites. Now, we know about the word love, and we think we understand it because we've studied this time and time again. We look at the Greek words, right? Y'all know them, agape, eros, phylos, um, storge, if you really want to get into it. And we're kind of comfortable with that because we know the definitions and how they're targeted, and they're very specific in the Greek. But we have never, to this day, looked at the Hebrew word for love. And the Hebrew word for love is ahab. And ahab is this incredible word because it's so different than the Greek. It is this unusual mix of, of emotions. It actually contains this very intense, passionate uh, emotion of the mind, I love you here, cerebrally. But at the same time, it includes this deep, passionate, intense love from the heart, like you would have for a spouse. Well, that's not the Greek way that we're used to. With agape, very narrow, that's God's love. Or phylos, that's a brotherly love. That's where we get the word Philadelphia from, the city of brotherly love. This is a huge term. All throughout the Old Testament, they would use this word to describe God's passionate, reckless love for his children. But at the same time, they would use it for a buddy from out of town that you would high five. They would use it for your family love, like, hey, father and son, but you would also use it in a very romantic, passionate way, like, I love my wife, I can't wait to get home and give her a hug. Or a kiss, whatever, you could do that, you're married. So it's this bizarre mix of, of all these terms, and we see this word, ahab, used, and the lesson right here is true love should be all-encompassing. When we get back to the law of first mention, and we see how this word was first used, true love is not passive. It's not just thinking happy thoughts for your neighbor. I love this online. Maybe you've seen this. You ever see somebody who's trying to cheer somebody up, or they, they mean well, but you can tell by the way they talk that they don't really know God? They certainly don't believe in prayer. And so they're trying to cheer themselves, and, and, and they don't really know what to say. So they'll say something like, uh, happy thoughts, <laughs> um, sending vibes your way, right? Like, good vibes, I'm singing of good vibrations. And, and you're like, what, what is a good vibe? What is it? May, the, may the cosmic winds blow good fortune your way. And you're thinking, what? what is, LOL, giggle, heart, <laughs> spirit fingers. And you're thinking, I, knew, I know what they mean, but it shows that they don't know the true ahab the true love of God. That's not what this word is describing, this good thoughts only. True love is active, and true love requires action. So you know, right out of the gate, I got to ask, how you doing with that? Is it easy to love someone from afar, wish them good thoughts, send them a smiley face? Peace out. Hey, I'm sending good vibes your way. God is calling us to something deeper. To love people right where they are, but to meet their needs, not only spiritually, but also physically. And that involves selflessness. And that involves intentionality. And that goes against what we really are. See, the flesh is at war with the spirit. Frankly, it is so much easier just to focus on ourselves. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to do a quick experiment. In just a sec, don't do it yet, Dave, but I want to put up a picture of a crowd, okay? And if you recognize the crowd, I just want to see what you instinctively do. Are you ready? Three, two, one, pow! All right. Look at that crowd, y'all. This is this year. This was taken like 100 days ago. Can you believe that? Like the, like the end of February. Now, I put that picture up because I want to ask you a question. Who did you instinctively look for first? <laughs> 
right? Who did you instinctively look for first? Ourselves. Here you go. Hold that. Thank you. We instinct. We don't have to teach ourselves this. Y'all remember in middle school when you got your braces on and you got your, your rake haircut in the front or your men, you got your mullet going on and, and you're sporting it and you're loving it and you're riding, you know you look good, but it's yearbook day and the yearbook comes out and the teachers are handing them out. By the way, for the younglings with us, yearbooks <laughs> are these books that have faces in them. Facebook kind of replaced that, but it's done a weird job of doing it, but there were actual books. And you'd get them, and they'd hand them out. And the first thing you would do is you would open it up, and you would look for who? Yourself. And you see, I had the braid on. It was at that with the big hair, the bangs all teased up. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You look for yourself first. Adults, you do the same thing. You still do it. You're sitting at uh, Los Trace, got your group of lady friends around, or maybe it's the guy friends, and someone says, let's take a selfie. Everybody lean in, Right? And take a picture and I say, okay, I'm going to post this. Can I tag you? Well, can I see it first? I want to look at it and see. Because right? if everybody else looks awesome and you got like broccoli sticking out of your teeth or somebody, you know, and you're like, mm, got five chins, you're like, that's not a good one. Isn't it funny, though, how it was good for everybody else? But you didn't look at anyone else in the photo. You looked at who? Yourself. This is what we do. And Scripture comes and says, that's not what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to love our neighbor with that kind of critical love and blessing. Look out for their best interest, the way we love ourselves. So what happens when inevitably there's somebody who comes along and says, well, we're supposed to love our neighbor, but <clears throat> teacher, who, who exactly is our neighbor? Well, I'm glad you asked, because Jesus was asked that exact same question by probably a snarky lawyer in fact, we're going to read in just a moment in Luke 10 that that's exactly who asked him. You remember the context. There's this lawyer, he stands up and it says, to put him to the test, he said, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Hmm. And Jesus looked and he said, I love this. He, he turns around, he asks a question. He says, well, what's written? You know the scriptures. How do you read the law? And the lawyer answered, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We know all that. We've talked about that over different passages over the last many weeks. And then he said, and then you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, yes, you've answered correctly. You get the prize. Go do this, and you will live. Unfortunately, the lawyer didn't leave it there. You just, I could just picture him. I could just picture him, man. He's, he's rubbing his chin. He's like, mm -hmm. and he has this classic lawyer speak. You know it's a lawyer because he says, he says uh, but desiring to justify himself, he looks at Jesus and says, oh, and, and who is my neighbor? We actually have a photo of this guy the moment he did that. This is an actual shot. Actually, you know what? Do we have the older shot of him when he was actually with Jesus? There he is. Yes. The exact same actor. This is from Chosen, by the way. Have you ever seen Chosen? If you have not watched The Chosen, this is my pastoral homework assignment. Do yourself a favor and go watch The Chosen, all eight episodes. You can binge watch it. You will be closer to the Lord having done it. Let me say, Dallas Jenkins did that. It is awesome. You can watch it with your whole family. This is that actor that you just saw a minute ago who is playing Nicodemus, and he's got this thing, and I can just hear him clearing his throat going, <clears throat> oh, well, oh, uh, I got my pipe here. Who is my neighbor? Y'all, Jesus layeth down the smack. He, you know it's going to be good because it says he shared a story. Look with me in the next verse. He says, so Jesus answered it with a story. He says, a Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. There's a scary road. You don't want to go down the Jericho road. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him up, and they left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. Awesome, a priest comes along. So you know it's going to be good because it's the pastor. So he shows up, and he says, but he saw the man lying there, and he crossed over to the other side of the road, and he passed him. Well, that's not good. Maybe somebody else will come. A temple assistant walks. Yes, a temple assistant. You know what that is? That's lay ministers. That's y'all, all right? So the main guy blew it. The priest, who was supposed to know better, he blew it. So the next people come up, temple assistants walk over, look at him lying there, and he also passed by on the other side. <laughs> okay, verse 33, then a despised Samaritan came. Okay, this is the despised. He's going to kick him. He's going to kick him while he's down. When he saw the man, he felt compassion. for What is going on with this story? Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. 
The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. And if the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I come here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said again, yes, ding, 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 ding. Now, go and do the same. Y'all, there is so much going on in this story. Don't miss the significance of what just happened, what Jesus is saying here. Notice that the person Jesus is applauding, the person that he is commending, was neither the religious leader, nor was it the lay ministers, those who were religious in the church, those who knew better. Instead, he commends a known, hated foreigner. Your Bible may even say Auburn fan. It's in there. You got to look close for it. It's, oh, that's just mine. This I cannot overemphasize how much Jews and Samaritans did not get along. They practiced open hostility. In fact, Jews openly declared that these Samaritans were less than human. They called them half-breeds, not only physically, but spiritually. Samaritans and Jews were like this. They practiced open hostility. So when Jesus shows up with this story, it is like taking a grenade and throwing it into the middle of this crowd that he's teaching. It is so radical. He says, from now on, love knows no national boundaries, and love has no geographical limits. And everyone there was shocked. He says, your neighbor is anyone who is worthy of your love, who is right across from you. And this is radical. And Jesus is reminding us, loving God, even if you are religious, those who know better, is empty if it's not backed with an expression of love toward the person who needs something, people who need it most. First John 4 says this, if someone says, I love God, but hates his fellow neighbor, that person is a liar. He is a lying liar who lies. In fact, it goes on to say, how can we say we love God who we can't see when we don't even love the people we can see? So he is coming here and he is telling us, guys, I'm going deeper with this. It almost makes you wonder if the Levite and the priest, the, the guys who know better, fell into a trap that I see a lot of people falling into today. You know what that trap is? It's judging the guy who's hurting for the brokenness he has, but not bothering to check why he's broken. Let me explain this. How easy is it for us to see someone who's in need? And we look at them, maybe we've got our kids with us, and we're walking like, oh, there's <laughs> put your hand over your eyes. Let's just walk this way. That guy, he's, he's probably a drunkard. Hmm. That guy's on drugs, right? So easy to say, all right, he did that. He brought that on himself. We'll just go over here. That guy's dangerous. He smells a little bit. He's dirty. He's, he's, he's not like us. Well, let's just pray for him from afar. Good vibes. <laughs> Heart. So we don't do that, oh, do we? We falsely assume so many times people who are broken got into that position because of their own foolish behavior. Sometimes, absolutely, but not every time. Here's what happens. This is what's wrong with us making that false assumption that it's just getting what they deserve, right? We even justify it with Scripture. We say, oh, they're just reaping what they sow, <laughs> right? See what I did there? I made it biblical. I was able to justify my lack of love and in getting involved because I said, well, you know, I mean, they did it themselves. They did, and sometimes, sure, they've done it themselves. But what if that was you? And the Levite was walking by, or the saved believer who knows Jesus was walking by and could have offered help, we didn't. See, here's the problem when we make these assumptions. Judging others for their brokenness distracts us from showing them the love of Jesus. I'm going to let that sit there awkwardly in the room for a second. Judging others for their brokenness distracts us from being able to love them and show them the love of Jesus. In Romans 13, Paul actually elaborates on this thought. I love it. Look with me in verse 8. He says this, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. 
For the commandments say, you know these, you must not commit adultery, you shouldn't murder, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't covet. All of these and such other commandments are summed up in this one commandment. It all comes down to this. Love your neighbor as yourself because love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills all the requirements of God's law. Then he goes on in verse 11, and he really puts the pedal down. He says, this is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Don't miss this. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here, church. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. I love that. Paul reiterates everything Jesus has said and everything Leviticus said from Moses way back. He summed it up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. But as we learned last week, this is not possible in our flesh. With our current heart, that is why and only why Jesus can give a heart transplant. We have to have a new flesh heart that he gives us that is soft and moldable, that breaks the stony heart of sin. Have you had that heart transplant? You can have that. Only, the only way to be able to fulfill this command to love others as he did is to put our faith and trust in Christ. Paul, puts, Paul uses this incredible word, put on the armor of light. And then over in verse 14, he says, put on the Lord Jesus. And it's this incredible Greek word, in duo. And I love it because he actually talks about it as if you are sinking in to your favorite robe. And he says, I want you to put on this love like you are sinking in to your favorite luxurious robe. The one that you got monogrammed. And this robe used to be a lot bigger. <laughs> Just pretend it closes good. You sink into it. And then I want you to put on Christ. This luxurious robe. Y'all know how good a luxurious robe feels? So I know you at home, dude, because you're still in it. You're still wearing it. You got your little bullwinkle slippers on and everything, and that's awesome. That's okay. I'll be up here sweating wearing this. He says, put on your faith in Christ. Put on your right shining armor through right living. Clothe yourself with it. Over in Ephesians 4.24, he uses it again. He says, put on the new self. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, when you wake up in the morning, unless you determine to live and surrender to Christ, that old flesh will rear up and you will not be looking out for the needs of others. You have to put your feet on the ground when you get out of bed and say, today, Lord, I surrender. What do you have for me today? Help me go through this day with my blinders off. Will you show me somebody who has a need so that I can put on my new self and meet that need? Just like that law expert, that lawyer, the <laughs> Buffy with his pipe. He says, well, teacher, who is my neighbor? That question is so relevant today. That's exactly what God is wanting us to love our neighbor. And I know it can be so overwhelming. If you're like me, you look around, you see need after need after need. You think, what can I possibly do? I see so many needs everywhere. In fact, Lord, if I'm being honest, I'm overwhelmed. Where do I start? What do I do? So if you have ever felt that way, relax. You are in good shape because Jesus gives us a sneak peek at this answer. Everything he's saying is driving towards this one point, okay? So if you feel overwhelmed and you think it's, well, what can I possibly do? There's so many needs. Jesus makes it clear right here. He says, our neighbor is the one right in front of us. Don't worry about them over there. Don't worry about the ones you can't do. Worry about the one who is right in front of you. The one that God has put in your path that day because it's not an accident. Or as Andy Stanley puts it so simply, I love it. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Isn't that great? Don't worry about the other ones. That's not your problem. God put that Samaritan in your way today. So you know I got to ask, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Let's get practical here. You know I love to do this. I'm going to get down to where we live right here in North Carolina. As you go about your day-to-day -day life, what is it you're thinking about? What is it that you're preoccupied with? In fact, I'm going to go ahead and call our band up. Musicians, you can go in place, and, and, and I, want, I want to share this, this closing story. When you are walking through your day this week, I want you to pay attention to the people around you. 
I want you to look around, and I want you to see if there's somebody who might need a word of hope. Or notice the fact that you, like me, are highly distracted. You're highly distracted. Maybe you're looking down on your phone, but there are people who have hearts, and, and they are bleeding, and they need a touch. It could be the cashier register. It could be at the gas pump. It could be the drive through person. It could be the person sitting at the next table. You're the one. You're the one that comes across that. Just this week, I had a lady in our church. She didn't want to be named. She said, I was checking out at Target, and there was a lady, or a man with three kids, and they got to pay at the end. They were sitting there at their little uh, checkout counter, and they didn't have enough. They were short, are you ready for this? True story, by one dime, 10 cents. And this lady, who happens to go to Potter's Hand, was telling me the story. She said, oh, sir, I'll, I'll give you a dime. Y'all, you would have thought she said, I'll give you a million dollars. The man looked at her and said, oh, no, no, I couldn't take that. She said, just a dime. And the kid said, Dad, I can, are we just a dime? She said, yeah, kids, you have it. No one had it. Their purchase sat there, and there was this awkward moment. She said, it's really no problem. <laughs> I'll give you the dime, you know, and didn't know if they were reluctant, like it's, it's got COVID or something. I'll put it on the ground and I'll back away. You can sanitize it. You can pick up whatever you need. It's just a dime. Reluctantly, they took it. They made their purchase. He turned around and thanked this potter's hand lady and said, thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Then each of the three children turned and looked at her and said, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. And they turned and left. Just when you thought the episode was over, the cashier looks at the potter's hand lady and says, that was really generous. You did good. It was just a dime. Ten cents. Ten cents. And it made a difference. Because this person had their head up. They weren't right here. They weren't doing their own thing. They were willing to be the hands and feet of Jesus. How about you? There are people hurting all around us, all around us, and we could be the one bright light, that in duo. We can, we can put on that armor of light, and we can shine in a dark and hurting world. I want to read you just a quick letter here. from a. It's an open letter that was published in the newspaper from a woman who was touched deeply in a situation just like this. Very practical help. A lot of believers came and loved on this lady. I'm going to put her picture up. Her name's Deborah Green, and this is a picture of her father, Lowell Herman. She writes this. Dear strangers, you may not remember me, but I remember you. Ten months ago, when my cell phone rang with the news of my father's sudden suicide, you were there walking into Whole Foods, the grocery store. You were prepared to go grocery shopping, just like I had been doing at Whole Foods, shopping for several minutes before you. But something had happened and changed my life. I had just abandoned my full cart of groceries, and I stood in the entryway of the store. My brother was on the other end of the phone, and he was telling me how my father had died, that he had taken his own life earlier that morning. And through his own sobs, I remember my brother who just kept saying, oh, Deborah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, Deborah. I can't even imagine how it must have felt for him to make that call to me. So after I hung up, I started to cry. I didn't realize how much I had lost control. I actually started to scream, and my whole body began to tremble. This can't be true. This can't be happening. Only moments before, I'm going about my errands, having a normal Monday morning, pushing my cart through Whole Foods. Only moments before, my life was perfectly intact. My family was here. Everything was fine. But now, overwhelmed with emotions, I actually fell to the floor because my knees buckled under the weight of what I had just heard. And you, you kind strangers, entered the scene. You could have kept on walking. Oh, you could have kept on walking. You could have ignored my cries, but you didn't. You could have simply stopped and stared at my raw, primal, raspy display of pain, but you didn't. Instead, you came and you surrounded me as I yelled through my sobs. Why? Why did this happen? Why has my dad done this? The question that continued to plague me for the last 10 minutes came now to my lips as a scream for the entire store to hear, Why? 
And I remember in that haze of emotions, one of you came up and asked for my phone and said, who can I call for you? And then they said, I, we need your password and we need to know your husband's name so we can search through your contacts. I must have stumbled and did that because I remember I could hear your words on the other end as you tried to reach my husband for him, leaving an urgent message for him to call me back. I recall hearing you discuss among yourselves who would drive me home in my car and who would follow that person back so they could bring them to the store. You didn't even know one another, but it didn't even matter because you encountered me, a stranger, in the worst moment of my life, and you coalesced around me with a common purpose to help me. I remember one of you asking if you could pray for me, if you could pray for my family, and I guess I must have said yes, because I remember it now, that very, oh, that very distinct Christian prayer being offered up in the name of Jesus, whom I didn't know. You see, I was of another faith. So was my family. And it still brings tears to my eyes and it makes me smile every time I remember your prayer. In my fog, I told you that I think I have a friend, Pam, who works here today. I think she's at, on, in Whole Foods, if you would just go look for her. And you went out and you searched for her. And thankfully, she was there that morning. And she came and you brought her to me. And I remember the relief when I felt I could see a face I recognized, a familiar, warm face. She took me back and she took me into the, 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 the comfort area of the store. And she cared for me so lovingly until my husband could finally come and get me. And I even recall as I sat with her, one of you sent back a gift card to Whole Foods. Though you didn't know me, you wanted to do something tangible, even something small, just to let me know you were thinking of me and holding me and my family in your prayers. That simple gift card helped feed my family for weeks when just the idea of cooking was so far beyond my emotional reach it was a godsend, and I never saw you again. But I know this to be true. If it were not for you showing me love, I would have gotten in the car, and I was in no shape to drive that car. If it were not for you, I don't know what I would have done in those first raw moments of overwhelming anguish, shock, and grief. But I thank God every day I didn't have to find out because of you, because of your kindness, because of your love, your compassion, your willingness to help a total stranger on the road to Jericho. You stayed with me until I was whole. Until this day, I remember it. No matter how many times my mind takes me back to that horrible, life-altering moment, I look back now and I see, you ready? It's not all darkness. It's not all darkness because you reached out to help. You offered a ray of light in my bleakest moment, the darkest moment I've endured. You may not remember it. I'll never forget it. You may not remember me, but I will never, ever forget you. And though you may never know it, I give thanks for your presence in my life every single day. So I want to challenge us. Be on the lookout, church, for those you can love. To love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That's my challenge, to live out the command of Jesus. Jesus makes it clear our neighbor is the one we come in contact with right in front of us. Will you take the challenge? Let's pray about it. Father, I thank you for the clarity of your word. You are here in this moment to speak to us, to change us more into the image of Jesus. That's why we've come, Lord. As we sung earlier, we surrender. Lord, would you have your way in this moment? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.